quick effects of um, of uh, corticosteroid or uh, glucocorticoid injections. And as you can imagine, it's a it's a fairly um, uh, broad topic. Um, is this not okay? I have nothing to disclose. So I'll start with a, with a, with a brief case presentation. Someone um, I'm, I actually saw myself um, over the last few years, an 82-year-old female. Uh, she is known with facet joint disease and spinal stenosis, um, and she's had minimal effect with previous um, oral medication was really hoping to avoid uh, the use of opioids. Um, over the let's say four or so years, let's say prior to a year or so ago when I last saw her, or maybe closer to two years ago now when I last saw her, uh, she had a series of facet joint blocks and lumbar epidurals. I think for the most part, I kind of did uh, facet blocks alternating with, uh, with lumbar epidurals, uh, probably about um, three, sometimes four of these per year with the average methyl prednisolone dose of about 40 milligrams or 10 milligrams of dexamethasone um, per uh, um, inject date. Um, usually she got about two months of pain relief. So, I mean, that would mean only about six or eight months a year she had significant pain relief. But uh, she felt that this was the only thing that was really um, effective and she was accepting of the risks. And I must say with this lady, um, I did spend quite a lot of time talking to her about the, the risks of repeated uh, corticosteroid injections. And she was adamant that she's 82 years old and uh, she wants to have her pain managed and she's okay with the risks. Um, so if we quickly go through um, some of the basic uh, science of uh, corticosteroids, the physiology first. Um, as most of us probably know, it's released on, usually on a daily basis uh, via the circadian rhythm um, and also then um, due to any stressors. The hypothalamus uh, secretes corticotrophin-releasing hormone and then the anterior pituitary gland releases ACTH and this in turn stimulates the adrenal cortex um, and this is a negative feedback system. At the level of the adrenal gland, this is just a brief picture so we can uh, recall all the, well, some of the um, hormones and, and transmitters that's released by the adrenal gland with the mineralocorticoids and the glucocorticoids being released by the um, adrenal cortex. And um, so cortisol and cortisone is the, the, the main um, hormones there that we're interested in today. So um, corticoids have, or corticosteroids, sorry, have um, um, significant function in carbohydrate, lipid, and protein metabolism, as well as uh, fluid and electrolyte metabolism. And it, um, it influences the function of the cardiovascular, immune, renal, skeletal, and nervous systems. And it is essential to our usual response to stress and noxious stimuli, as well as the environmental changes, and it also facilitates the action of other hormones. So this is a, a quick slide with a um, mnemonic for some of the um, relatively common side effects that we could encounter, side effects or complications with the use of uh, corticosteroids. Um, I put this one in for Virginia if the other mnemonic was, um, was, was too long for her. And so if we look at people that's been subjected to um, either exo exogenous or endogenous um, corticoid overload, they might have uh, cushing oil changes. And um, this often involves the redistribution of fatty tissues and this leads to moon faces, trunkal obesity, a buffalo hump, and then epidural lipomatosis, which is something, to be honest, I wasn't really that familiar with, and we've had a few discussions about it at our lunch rounds, and um, it's probably something to keep in mind if we're going to treat someone with back pain and potentially make things worse by injecting corticosteroids all the time. Um, 
Hyperglycemia seems to be mostly an issue for um, diabetic patients, and obviously for brittle diabetics, it is a, it could be a significant issue. In the average non-diabetic patient, it's probably not going to be that that relevant. It can promote hyperlipidemia, some electrolyte changes. Um, the weight gain there is. Um, some contradicting evidence, but a lot of it may be due to transient um, fluid overload or fluid reabsorption and not necessarily long-term weight gain. Um, the hypothalamic and pituitary axis is um, also... I beg your pardon? Okay, I'll continue. Um, most of us are probably aware that it can affect bone metabolism. And if you look at this uh, schematic, you can see at virtually every possible um, component of bone metabolism, it, had a, it has a potential adverse effect, um, including effects on the osteocytes, osteoblasts, and osteoclasts. But the net effect um, remains decreased bone formation and increase in uh, bone resorption. And these things I know are, are, are pretty basic, but I thought I would just quickly browse through it. The effect on bone metabolism is, is um, interesting that we, I think most of us often look at a bone mass density score, which is the most commonly um, done test for um, osteoporosis or osteopenia. However, the trabecular bone score can also be affected, and this can be independent. In, in a lot of patients, both of these scores would be affected. But the bottom line is the fracture risk is decreased. I don't think there's much um, um, speculation in, in, in that. And second thing is even an, a relatively normal bone mass density um, does not mean that it's a free for all and the patient can be subjected to a whole lot of um, corticosteroids. It may still have an adverse effect. Cardiovascular effects, there are quite contradicting evidence. We know that the risk factors are often affected, these being hypertension, or the blood pressure, glucose control, and dyslipidemia, and potentially also transient issues with hypercoagulability. Um, however, there's, there, there isn't any very good evidence with linear um, relationships between corticosteroid use and uh, that's exogenous corticosteroids and uh, cerebrovascular, car, um, cardiovascular, or venous thromboembolism risk. Embolism risk. Um, it does increase the risk of peptic ulcer disease, and you see there, there's the, the prednisone dose of more than five milligrams per day is noted, and in a lot of the, the literature, that would be the kind of the cutoff for what's usually acceptable um, for more chronic use, and the idea is that that is similar to um, basal cortisol released by the average person. Um, with any immune modifying drugs, there's um, always the, the concern of uh, possible um, malignancies, and there's good evidence that it doesn't seem to promote colorectal cancer, cancer and um, not really anything too suggestive or worrisome in, in most other cancers. The psychological effects is something we, we probably don't pay a whole lot of attention to, um, and we probably should. Um, a lot of our patients suffer from at least some of these effects listed here. Insomnia, for sure. Mania, maybe not as common, but depression, definitely. Um, cognitive impairment, maybe too. Um, and, and it is very common, more common than we would probably like to know how often these um, psychological symptoms are affected by the use of exogenous uh, corticoid, um, glucocorticoids. Um, just a, a brief look at the relative um, potency of these medications. Um, the bottom part is obviously what, what we use more commonly. Um, so if you correlate that with uh, prednisone, for instance, you'll see that, um, you know, a mole of trimcinolone that we all often would, would use in the injectate correlates to about 10 days worth of uh, prednisone or that we correlate to about a day's worth of um, glucocorticoid um, secretion by, by your own um, adrenal glands. Um, and if we look at those dosages, there's, there's not a lot of good evidence that, let's say, injecting 40 milligrams of trimcinolone means you inject 10 days worth of cortisol. 
because of the variability in, in how long these medications stay active and take to be metabolized and so forth. So when we um, inject or, or use the medications in, in pain medicine, it could obviously be in various uh, forms. It could be injected in various areas um, or it could be administered orally. Um, and this is probably well known to everyone, but I wish to point out that the literature is really quite variable because of um, a variety of practices and indications for, for procedures, which really makes it um, difficult to come up with any um, you know, homogenous guidelines, and that's probably why we don't have very good guidelines. There are such a huge variety of procedures, and in the, the inject dates, um, whether people use um, a glucocorticoid with a local anesthetic um, uh, added to the injectate or just a glucocorticoid by itself, whether it's um, versus a placebo or versus local anesthetic or versus PRP or versus um, regular um, management or conservative measures, those all make it difficult to really come up with, with any um, very um, black and white different um, guidelines. Um, so what I put together is, a, is, is quite a few um, studies that I looked at to try and kind of make us all think about whether it's indicated or not to use uh, glucocorticoids um, and whether there's any evidence for or against it. Um, and obviously it, it varies from, from uh, site to site um, what, what the level of the evidence is. In, uh, you know, so, so this was a, a large study, a review study, uh, published in 2018. Um, they looked at multiple different areas, including here, the glenohumeral joint in patients with um, adhesive capsulitis, and they found improved pain and function, but only for about a month. Um, with hip injections and knee injections, the duration was um, somewhat better, um, gauged at uh, six months for hip and for knee, three months um, of improved pain. And um, these studies may be evaluated uh, trimestrin alone and meet all pregnancy alone. Um, for other large joint injections, um, this was done on um, also for adhesive capsulitis, like in the previous um, review article. Um, they had this, however, was a uh, randomized trial with 120 patients in three arms. Um, and they looked at the difference between the intraarticular corticosteroid. Um, or intraarticular with the rotator cuff interval um, versus placebo. And they followed the patients for um, about half a year. Um, after six weeks, most patients in the uh, active groups were um, improved, but at uh, 26 weeks, um, minimal of any um, difference. And that's probably what, what we're used to see in practice. It, it rarely lasts as long as that. Um, this study was published in 2019 um, for knee injections, and they looked at um, hyaluronic acid with or without corticosteroids. Um, and interestingly, they found that the addition of corticosteroids did um, have a statistically significant, not huge, but statistically significant um, increase or, or improvement in, in WOMAC uh, scores. Uh, with the addition, again, of corticosteroids. Um, another study um, really showing that trimcinolone um, versus lidocaine only did give improved pain and function for up to about three months in the um, corticosteroid groups, um, but the higher versus lower dose did not confer any benefit to the patients. So bottom line, lower dose is, in this situation, deemed as effective. Um, a further study of uh, by the same author um, as the first one, um, Daniel Kushman, um, they looked at um, corticosteroid versus placebo specifically, and they found mostly an improved outcome with corticosteroids. Now, I must say this, I mean, these, these uh, meta-analyses, um, it's, it's not that, you know, a, a whole, a, a good many of these um, studies were kind of inconclusive, but on a whole, they found that it's probably um, 
for the most part, improved outcome or longer lasting pain relief with corticosteroids. Um, at different doses, they found that um, it is mostly similar. A few of the studies did suggest that a larger dose may last longer, um, but the risk versus the benefit, I suppose, be, um, ends up being the, the, the main question and it didn't demonstrate a huge difference. Um, different corticosteroids um, did not seem to make uh, a significant difference whether you use particulate or non-particulate or within these groups uh, specific ones the volumes of injected were showed um, really a huge uh, difference in or, or a huge vari variability in the in the injected volumes um, i can't really think of anyone that I've seen using 16 moles of uh, injected for a glenohumeral joint, but anyway, that's that's what's reported, and they didn't find any difference in the injected volume. So unfortunately, again, no no good um, guidelines or, or recommendations coming from it. Um, a similar study the next year, or, or a review um, meta-analysis by the same author. Um, looking at small joints in particular and um, really showed they are mostly effective um, but there was in, in um, significant well not not any significant evidence to suggest that any of the specific um, agents were better or the dose or the volume was not very well studied for perineural injections, this first one I'll briefly touch on because this is really from anesthesia literature. So it's mostly in acute pain management. Um, so for regional anesthesia, the, the addition of um, dexamethasone to a local anesthetic block does seem to prolong the, the action of the block for about six or so hours. Um, but it's, um, it's not sure that that can be extrapolated to chronic pain. However, in 2015, uh, Dr. Bhatia from Toronto published this uh, meta-analysis looking at um, regional nerve blocks for uh, peripheral neuropathic pain and the corticosteroid groups did have longer lasting and improved um, relief with the addition of corticosteroids. Um, I could not find any um, evidence that there's any use for uh, corticosteroids in myofascial pain and I, th I think the majority of people don't, don't really use that as a um, as a rule. In, in bursitis, um, the first study showed some improvement um, with the use of uh, triamcin alone uh, versus just lidocaine. Um, so 34% of patients um, improved with the lidocaine group, 55% at three months, but at 12 months, um, similar outcome. Although that's probably not surprising. Again, we don't necessarily anticipate these uh, would last 12 months. I think three months is probably as good as we, we would often hope for. Um, the second study um, again showed intervention versus placebo, the intervention being a corticosteroid injection and the placebo in this case was uh, saline. Um, and as you can see, you, you can see a, a slight um, difference in the outcome for the first, and those are days by the way. So when you get to like three and a half, four weeks, the um, the uh, numerical rating score for pain is, is uh, the same. And that's really only a, a change of about one for the first um, you know, two to three or so weeks. So a very, very minimal um, difference with saline versus corticosteroid in this um, randomized trial in bursitis. That is, so that's, um, both of those studies were for like trochanteric bursitis or pyrotrochanteric um, disease. In SI joints, this is a, a study from about three years ago um, that looked at um, methylprednisolone with, with lidocaine versus PRP. You can see the initially for the first few weeks, the, the um, uh, effect was similar, but thereafter the um, PRP seemed to be more effective with a, um, with a um, VAS score at, uh, what's it, two months uh, that's more than two points lower in the PRP group. So epidural corticosteroids is um, a bit of a, a minefield, as you guys might think, uh, or, or we, we probably know. Um, there are small cohorts in most of the studies. Um, the indication for the procedure, I think, is a big issue. Um, a lot of these are done for random back pain and some for um, more specific leg pain and then there's the acute versus chronic um, uh, groups 
And um, the site of injection obviously varies. Um, the dose administered, the injected volume, whether adjuncts like uh, anti-inflammatories or narcotics or local anesthetics obviously is, is um, used as part of the injectate. Um, and then the outcomes measured. Um, a lot of the studies just look at pain, but also a lot of them look at disability and some of the more recent ones or the, the ones that's, that's driven by government organizations look at the prevention of surgery, um, which is obviously a totally uh, different uh, group than looking at pain. Anyone add any comments? Sorry, I heard something. So I thought a little. So, on a whole, uh, most of these studies seem to show uh, some relief, but quite short term, six to 12 weeks, with a modest change in disability um, and a minimal, if any, long term benefit. Um, before I really look at, at epidurals and the, the, um, the evidence per se, uh, this was a survey study for uh, done on SIS members, 314 members responded, and this was themselves reporting what they used for lumbar and cervical epidurals. And you can see here there's, a, there's quite a big variability. There's a lot of people that, that use particular corticosteroids in um, epidural injections where others think it's, it's unacceptable. The dose varies um, significantly. If I go to the next slide, you can see there, um, if they just look at the dexamethasone um, utilizers, um, 10 milligrams, obviously it would, you know, one vial seems to be the, the average go-to, um, but there are people that use 20 milligrams, people that use only four, et cetera. So quite, quite a big variability in the dose. And then secondly, probably as important, I would say, is the amount of injections that's deemed acceptable or appropriate um, by a, a certain practitioner. So you can see there are some people in allow up to, you know, eight, nine, ten injections. That is um, um, a significant uh, or, or, or a very small number. But if you go up to like six injections, that's that's um, a fairly high percentage that allows up to six percent for uh, six injections, for instance. So some of the studies looking at um, evidence for epidurals and specifically here the dose. Um, so this was patient that had already all had steroid epidurals in the past. I think for inclusion criteria that they have to have had one in the last three or four months. And then they um, did, oh yeah, there, I wrote there uh, two epidurals in the last 12 months, sorry. And um, they looked at methoprednisolone 40 versus 80 milligrams um, and that this in cordial epidurals and after 12 weeks with a, um, a crossover and they found no difference of uh, 40 to 80 milligrams. And I think a lot of people have, have, uh, have moved towards that kind of dosage where 10 years ago, I think 80 milligrams was probably kind of average for, for a, um, an epidural. Um, this was a study that this was published quite a while ago, 13, 14 years ago. Um, so it showed at four months a minor, um, shall I say, better response in the 80 milligrams group. But overall, this was not uh, really significant. It was like a 12% um, improvement and um, not statistically significant. Um, this also published a, quite a lot of data in the kind of mid 2010s, and this was a randomized control study um, in 120 patients with lumbar disc herniation, and they looked at um, or they injected um, lidocaine um, with uh, beta methasone versus lidocaine um, without corticosteroid, and the successful outcome was a 50% improvement in both numerical rating scale and uh, OSWIS3's uh, disability index for three weeks. And then they would repeat the procedure in successful patients, and the patients were followed up to a year. And um, so in this study, what they found apparently was there was a trend toward longer lasting effects with the use of cortisone um, with serial procedures. I'm not sure this is what I see here. If you look at the uh, group one is the, actually the control, the lidocaine only group, and group two is the ones with the corticosteroid um, added to the injectate. And really there in the middle of the screen on the left side, it shows, um, you know, for the initial two procedures, the pain relief, this is pain relief in weeks, 
was 8.2 for the lidocaine only group, 6.3 weeks on average for the um, corticosteroid group, and then with the subsequent two injections, it was somewhat better in the um, corticosteroid group versus the lidocaine group. Really, the overall um, average per procedure was 10 versus 10.5. So I'm not sure you can say in the long run it trains towards longer lasting relief for corticosteroids. Um, although that was their, their conclusion. Um, so a similar study done, the same amount of patients randomized by uh, the same author, uh, it's actually Manchi Kanti, not Marshi Kanti, I think, but anyway, um, with caudal epidurals, and um, they found very similar results, although they did note that there were more uh, non-responders than in the interlaminar trial, but very similar results in terms of uh, really the results being very similar, uh, whether corticosteroid was included or not. This was uh, a study of uh, trimcinolone and a uh, reasonably high dose 60 milligrams um, in uh, portal epidurals uh, versus uh, leukocyte rich um, PRP. And um, it showed, you know, similar pain relief um, up to about a month or six weeks or so. And then the um, PRP group uh, seemed to outperform the corticosteroid group somewhat, not by a huge margin, but it was uh, statistically significant. Um, the study published in 2014, looking at 400 patients with, um, um, again, lidocaine with or without corticosteroid, um, did find that there was no difference with the addition of corticosteroid. Again, here you can, um, uh, there, there can be a lot of comments about the, um, the study itself with the injectates, volumes, and concentrations of uh, local anesthetic, um, and also the composition of the corticosteroid varying significantly. But still, at least at a fair amount of patients, 400 patients randomized, and uh, they, they found no difference with the addition of corticosteroids, and also um, followed these patients up to six weeks where they demonstrated corticosteroid sub, uh, subsuppression for that long. And this is just a, a, a graph uh, which I found somewhat interesting for two reasons. I mean, obviously these, these things converge and, and have very similar outcomes here with these uh, scores on, on pain and disability both, but uh, the interlaminar and the transforaminal um, roots seem to show similar um, if, effects, although that was not the, the outcome that they looked at. Um, this study did not look at corticosteroids versus placebo. This was particulate versus non-particulate. And uh, in 2017, they found that in these, but well, that was about nearly 500 patients that they did find uh, the particular particulate steroid to be more effective than the non-particulate. Now, I know a lot, a lot of people uh, prefer not to use particulates because of uh, safety concerns, but they found that it might be more effective in the study of 500 patients. Um, so I'm getting towards the end of the epidural component, so bear with me for another couple of slides, I think. Um, this was 418 uh, 18, the um, patients that they did a retrospective observational study on, and um, they looked at trimes and alone 40 milligrams versus uh, 4 milligrams. Um, and I think this is very um, basic evidence, but I know um, our colleague here, Chris uh, Marais, um, he, he likes the idea of individualized medicine and likes the idea that, um, you know, we probably shouldn't use the same medication or, or plan for, for each and every patient uh, with, um, you know, condition A. Um, and, and here they showed that the trimcinolone was significantly more effective um, than dexamethasone, but in the patients that were not in excruciating pain initially, their, um, their outcomes were actually similar um, and, and uh, in those patients, dexamethasone was, was not um, less effective than trimcinolone. Now, that obviously becomes a, a bit of a conundrum, but it opens up the kind of your mind towards uh, is, is trimcinolone or is particulate versus non-particulate 
and or there subgroups of people in which it might work for condition A or condition B, uh, based on, for instance, the um, the baseline uh, pain score. Um, so intrathecal betamethasone, I've, I've, I've never actually seen anyone administer this, but uh, this is this is in in cancer pain. Uh, so they they had the this is a um, prospective study with patients divided in group A and group B. Group A was the um, um, at, at vertebral metastases, and group B had distant metastases, and they found a slight increase in pain um, with um, with intrathecal injection of a fairly low dose of betamethasone, um, but a significant improvement in the vertebral meds patients. And this was with, as I said, a fairly low dose, uh, low volume injectate, um, done like a normal, shall I say, anesthesia spinal, probably in the like mid lumbar, um, mid lumbar levels, and even up to the mid to high thoracic spine in its show efficacy for uh, vertebral meds. Um, and it also showed in, in those groups that um, a lot of patients, well, the patients had much less need for escalation of their um, opioid and other analgesics in the um, group treated with the intrathecal betamethasone. So, getting closer to the end here, um, in middle branch neurotomy, um, this was, um, I believe, one of the earlier studies um, reporting on the efficacy of um, two medications here, uh, methoprednisolone and pentoxifilin, um, in the prevention of uh, post-RFA neuritis, and it showed um, that pretty much in the saline or control group, there was an incidence of 26% um, of, of patients with uh, significant pain a week or so after, and one out of the 15 patients, so about six or seven percent, um, did have pain ongoing after a month. Um, however, so that was 45 patients. This is uh, a newer study published a year and a half ago, 164 patients um, looking at trimsinolone versus control. They had uh, lidocaine prior to the neurotomy and then uh, trimsinolone with or with, oh, sorry, pepivacaine with or without trimsinolone and uh, insignificant um, change in the incidence of, um, of post RFA neuritis found in this study. So, this is a, a study with um, a study end date of um, about seven, eight months from now. Uh, so I suppose it'll be a couple of years before we see much about it. Um, but it's an RCT of um, patients undergoing um, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, or um, sacral neurotomies. And it's only um, the, one of the inclusion criteria is bilateral procedures, and the, the patient within service is on control with the. Um, with the uh, corticosteroid being utilized on the one side and um, um, a local anesthetic only on the on the opposite side, um, I'm I'm not sure. I couldn't find out what um, numbers they were looking to recruit and if they were getting there. But if they could get substantial numbers in the study, that might um, give us a little bit more uh, definitive information, and it might even. Um, define whether there's a significant difference between the incidence in, let's say, cervical versus lumbar neurotomy, um, post-neurotomy neuritis. Um, so this was actually from an ENT, ear, nose and throat article, but I think it's, it's still worth quickly noting that I'm, I'm not sure about um, the rest of the, um, um, of the listeners, but um, I, I know I, I tend to focus more on the, I briefly touch on the corticosteroids and probably focus on the, the procedure itself um, more so. I don't think it's very common that we have a procedural issue, but the corticosteroid issues is, is just um, probably buried under the surface and we, and we, we rarely pay enough attention to, attention to it. So this was looking at um, the most common issues with uh, the administration of corticosteroids in ear, nose, and throat, but I think it can be just extrapolated to our practice. So incorrect dose. I, I just think I, at this time, I suppose we're in a way fortunate that 
there really is no recommended dose, but um, in the next few years, um, I'm, I'm hoping we, we can have more consensus on a um, acceptable dose, and um, then it might be, you know, it might end up um, affecting our practice, and, and you might get, end up getting in trouble if you don't stick to the recommended dose. Um, communication failure, as always, inappropriate drug at this stage, very little um, evidence to use the one or the other in the majority of procedures, but again, that, that may really change. Um, inappropriate duration, so I suppose in our situation that might mean inappropriate amount of injections, and then we always have to consider there's a lot of patients that also get a shoulder injection from their family physician or someone, and um, we have to be sure we, we uh, calculate the whole dose that the patient's exposed to. Um, incorrect route of administration, probably not that significant in our situation, I hope. Um, it is the most frequent medications in, um, cited in lack of informed consent claims. So, um, and it's something we use daily and maybe after the dermatologist and ENT specialist probably use it the most in, in of, of, of all groups. Um, so their recommendations are um, to discuss with the patient the rationale for use, um, the expected benefits, the alternatives, the risks involved with use, and obviously documentation of the discussion. Very basic, but I think um, I, I know I can improve on, on this. So a few take-home messages. Um, there's no indication for glucocorticoids in myofascial injections, and unfortunately, that's, that's one of the only close to black and white uh, recommendations uh, I could find. Um, in, at the intraarticular level, it may well be beneficial, but the dose can be limited, and I think that is well demonstrated. Uh, we may more know about the incidence of uh, post neurotomy uh, neuritis and the, um, the efficacy of glucocorticoids in avoiding and in, in preventing that in a year or two. Um, and we may get surprising results with local anesthetics only. Um, I know some people have adopted that, that strategy already, but a lot of us are still using corticosteroids probably more than we necessarily have to. Um, so we should always consider any corticosteroid conserving measures. Is the um, procedure indicated in the first place? Uh, what would be the um, recommended dose? And obviously I mentioned there is very few recommendations, but if you're wondering if you should use five or 10 of the examethasone, you should probably use five. Um, for the most part, there's, there's little evidence that the, the larger dose has pain benefits and obviously it has other issues. Um, viscous supplementation, not always available due to financial constraints, but should be considered. Prototherapy, um, same thing, not always available like PRP and stem cells, but these are things we should, we should always um, consider. Um, Botox injections, um, I wasn't really familiar with this, but it could even be used intraarticularly apparently. Um, intraarticular anti-inflammatories, there's some evidence for um, Efficacy in Ketorolac, for instance, intraarticularly, it is not um, it is not a huge benefit, but neither is uh, most of our other injectates. And then to proceed to neuro neurotomy would, would obviously decrease the amount of steroids we use, provided we don't use it for post neurotomy neuritis prevention, and we they last long enough. Um, the risk versus the benefit should always be uh, considered as with all parts of medicine. So if I can finish up with this uh, presentation, um, the case I discussed earlier, um, lovely lady, 82 years old, uh, she ended up having a, uh, an MI. And um, just because I, I knew her quite well, I knew her family, um, I heard a lot of the things um, going on behind the scenes, which I certainly wouldn't have heard otherwise. Um, so she went to our closest cardiology institution 500 kilometers away, um, had her, her, um, her PCI uh, stent placed. Um, I think it was about three days later, her daughter brought her back home. They stopped for gas and she slipped and fell on the ice and uh, fractured her hip. And last I heard of her, this was probably somewhere between 18 months and two years ago. So it was probably about at least a year after these two incidents. She was still mostly bed bound. Um, 
she was um, she was obviously still still in pain. Nothing nothing had changed there, but um, I don't think I can say that the injections necessarily um, caused her MI or her her, um, her femur neck fracture. But um, it, it it certainly um, because it's someone I know and I hear of every now and then. It's something I keep in the back of my mind all the time. Um, that number one is it is it necessary because it may confer risk. It was an eye opener. Um, and um, number two, we, we, we wouldn't know about these, um, these um, adverse events in a lot of patients. Um, and and we, we probably need to be sure we have good reason to inject corticosteroids when, when we do. And I think that's about it. <laughs>